Okay. Uh, hello. Welcome back to uh, session number 22 of the Libraries in Response series on the question, what is a library if the building is closed? Uh, we started these in late March, uh, just about 10 days or so after the pandemic was declared, which happens to be exactly six months ago today, on March 11th, uh, when the WHO declared the, the global pandemic, though it apparently had been in effect or spreading for three months before that. Uh, so this, is, this has really been an interesting set of, uh, of exercises. Welcome back, uh, everybody that's returning, and welcome for the first time, those of you who have uh, checked this out, and uh, hopefully we'll provide you something close to what you were expecting or at least hoping for. Um, our, our topic today is on public access, priorities, and strategies. We've got three excellent speakers. Uh, our series is hosted and recorded by IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in Holland, we used to say, Netherlands. And the recordings are, uh, we get those up within a couple of days and those are all uh, available and archived on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net, our, our home site there. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. <clears throat> My name is Don Means. GLN is this open collaboration. Uh, it's a, really an ad hoc organization. Uh, there's no corporation or anything. It's just a loose asso association of uh, interesting libraries doing amazing things with technology and <laughs> looking to collaborate on specific projects. Uh, most of what we've done over the last few years has been around the use of wireless technology. Speakers are Lisa Shaw from the Maine State Library, who's returning with us. Uh, good to have you back, Lisa. And for the first time, Natalia Fodocic. I tried, I should have asked you for a, a test run on that, Natalia. Uh, with uh, the Alliance for Affordable uh, Internet and the World Wide Web Foundation. And Stephen Weiber, who may be known to most of you as our, our trustee, uh, man at the controls there with IFLA in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands and will be a presenter today for the first time. So um, just wanted to touch that the pandemic is topic A, libraries in response is basically in response to the pandemic, but it's not the only thing happening. Uh, this chart is tracking the cost of uh, billion dollar storms uh, in, the, in the US, <coughs> excuse me, which I think is gonna have a significantly taller bar there on the right uh, after this year, and it's expected to continue. These are mostly climate driven weather, extreme weather events. And you know they're getting more intense and more frequent, and it is not expected to uh, reverse. Uh, just a little report from the West Coast here. This is air quality map. I just pulled this down an hour ago from uh, Purple Maps, whatever the name of it is. And you can see these numbers are not quite off the chart, but a lot of them are right up against the, the top number, you know, 300 plus, 400, just, you know, the whole West Coast is on fire and... Uh, Kind of kind of grim, uh, but today we're going to you know get into public access. So uh, one strategy we've talked about before, the idea of the of neighborhood library access stations as a, as a term uh, that people would ideally be uh, close to, you know, within easy distance of. So as either a primary source of internet access. Uh, we know that in the U.S., tens of millions of people have no other source of, of internet access except the public library, which is now, in most cases, closed. So that's the library parking lot. 
uh, for uh, a lot of people. And roughly one in three adults has accessed the internet at, a, at an American library uh, before the pandemic. That number at around 80 million people, one reason or another, have, have gone to the library for, for that we would say essential service. And it's not just the internet. It's, we would describe this as access to public information and, and services. So the whole gamut, and of course it includes the open internet, but it also includes obviously the digital services of the library or, or the local government or the state or federal or national governments. Uh, these are just, you know, non-negotiable kinds of uh, services, absolutely critical services. So. The idea of setting up these access stations that are close to people uh, is, is something we've been advocating and working on uh, for years and are planning to re-up. There's a new IMLS window grant. We're looking to uh, uh, go back for another, another round. Uh, we've been fortunate to win several of them so far, but we'd, we love this sign. We'd like to see these just all over the place or uh, maybe something like this would be would be okay if you could actually get the librarian to go out there, you know, instead of a bookmobile, you have a kind of a traveling librarian would show up in the neighborhood. You know, it's just, it's just a notion, you know, whatever, whatever works, anything will help. And while we talk about, you know, everyone needs a connection at home, there's no argument about that. And, and the, the, the fact that it hasn't already happened is a result of the lack of, of continued commitment to the to the concept of universal service, which the history has been that if it's if it's a basic service, then everybody should have affordable access to it. Uh, but with the arrival of the web in the mid '90s, there was just a separation from that pledge to the actual provision of, of broadband and internet services, and and the companies have said, well, no, we're just private companies, and we'll make investment decisions based on our expected return of investment. And that has shortchanged uh, the, the more difficult places to reach, rural and, and uh, parts of urban areas uh, that are more economically challenged. But it's just no excuse. It's, it, and now with the, with the pandemic, it's gone from being an embarrassment to a crisis. And, and that's really the focus of what we're, what we're uh, about today. So uh, Lisa, we're gonna ask you to lead off and update us on uh, what's been happening in Maine and what the state library has been up to. I mean, it's a lot, it's a big question, the way I just phrased it. Uh, you can touch on anything you want to, but we are especially interested in the library strategy around public access and expanding it. I know all the libraries have turned on their, their Wi-Fi and pointed the antennas out the window so they can, people can get better signals from a little farther away in the parking lot, but we want to hear, you know, what, whatever else you've got going on or planned, and then uh, we'll move through with our other speakers. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Lisa. All right, thank you. I'm going to share my screen, not to give you PowerPoint poisoning, but just to help me stay on topic here. Um, So that's me. And these are statistics that we pulled together from the uh, 2019 annual report that libraries submit uh, to um, IMLS every year. Uh, this is from Maine, and these were the things that we were actually able to track. One of the things when we're talking with um, broadband coalitions nationally and in the state is that uh, service providers want to know what the take rate is going to be in an area. You know, if they're going to deploy out infrastructure, you know, what's the take rate going to be? Here are the usage statistics from our 256 uh, public libraries around the state. And again, uh, some of these we weren't able to collect data at all because we can't collect the data correctly so bad data is worse than no data so you can imagine how much more um, people are actually using these sessions if we were actually able to measure them this is yeah. pretty significant yeah. well and, it's like a lot though and uh this was something uh, which I'll touch on in just a minute that we also presented to the FCC that they were quite interested in or the advisory committee that we spoke to. Um, 
you know, in the before times, as my daughter calls them, sure. you know, we had some really good stuff going uh, in terms of making progress and building out on on broadband and people could go to the library and use the library for this and use the library for that. But pandemic hit and we had uh, what I've heard accident reconstructionists call a fatal Delta V when you're moving forward and all of a sudden, bam, you hit something and you're slammed backwards. And that's what happened with our libraries around the state. Everything had to shut down. And all of a sudden people that were needing to, you know, oh my God, my job just closed. I need to file for unemployment. There's all these, you know, programs or loans that are being offered, forgivable loans for um, small businesses. I don't have access to go in and do that. Um, the, the most notable case in our state was people trying to apply for unemployment. The site was not optimized for mobile. And that's what a lot of people around the state, unfortunately, were relying on is, you know, US Cellular, Verizon, T-Mobile and a few select places. Um, so uh, a group of us were invited to speak to, and I say us, um, people working in the library industry um, around the US to talk to an advisory committee on diversity and digital empowerment uh, to the FCC. And this was back in June. Um, and there is a recording of it. I can throw the link in the chat um, in a few minutes if you want to go back and watch that. Um, but the main thing that came out of that, the main point that they heard, the question they asked us is if money is no uh, obstacle, what can the FCC be doing to help you further your work? And it just really came down to loosen the restrictions. Um, you know, it's been fun and nice to be the anchor institutions, but we have got to be able to build out on that. Um, and so, you know, don't don't make us go back and do the same thing we were doing five, 10 years ago with hotspot lending programs. First of all, they're going up black market prices if you could even get them at all. And second of all, the carriers just weren't working that robustly in areas that really needed it. It was it was just not even worth doing at all. And we heard that from people working with adult ed in different programs that are like this, this, this isn't working. It wasn't working for students, parents that are working at home, all of a sudden they're having to share the network with their kids doing their schoolwork. Uh, and, and it's just been disastrous. Um, we got to stop messing around with this. Um, Maine has a, a wonderful history of, you know, it's so much easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Um, so one of the things we didn't tell the FCC, but has happened in the past is that um, the E-rate connection, the fiber to the door that um, one library in particular got in Greenville, um, the town took part of that connectivity out from under E-rate, paid for it with tax increment financing and kicked it out just as far as they could to the whole downtown. There was pushback from the um, provider at first on that to say, well, you know, you don't really need it. Obviously, if you're, you know, just kicking it out to the whole town, obviously your library didn't need it that bad, but that argument really went nowhere. Uh, it, it, it has to happen. We had to find ways to, to push these out further than just the building. Um, Millinocket did something very similar. They got a white space antenna, um, put it on the roof so they could light up the downtown. Network Maine uh, is the entity that handles our E-rate funding and connectivity in Maine. They just ran a separate lineup real quick so that you know they didn't get on uh, the FCC's naughty list for this. And again, creative outside the box thinking for solving a very real problem. Um, we've we've had funders who haven't always realized that libraries are major economic drivers in their communities. Um, but they are, you know, and it, it we got to get past this, you know, you come to us thing. It's it's just got to be more ubiquitous. Um, kiosks have been on our radar lately. Um, you know, can we look at ways to start relaying that signal out and call it a library kiosk? And the Library of Michigan actually has a nice little definition on their website that they had put up. I understand in anticipation of something like this happening. Um, my library development director, Janet McKenney, tells me that there hasn't been a lot of um, take on this yet as far as people grabbing it and using this definition, but it is a pretty good one. Um, and it does seem to comply with, you know, what USAC would call, you know, a, a kiosk. Um, so we're looking at, you know, can we start relaying our connectivity out that way? And it's still technically a library service. Um, 
and that is it for that. Um, the other thing I wanted to just show you real quick, this presentation is online. It was an E-rate um, instructional thing for um, tribes who were looking at getting some E-rate funding. And it just basically is the background of who makes the rules on E-rate funding. This is from 2016. So the quick breakdown is who's responsible for what and who's answering to whom on how this gets decided. And um, kiosks, we know right now are eligible for discounts under uh, E-rate category one funding, not for category two. The big difference being that the category one gets the connectivity to the location. Um, category two is more about you know, maintaining the infrastructure around it. So the category one is actually more important in this. So that's where we're at right now is looking for more creative ways to get our uh, really robust connections out there. Maine has, again, 256 or so public libraries. Most of them are getting a thousand, my God, it's to the door, it's symmetrical. Um, some still have 100 or 200, but working up a couple are up to 2000. And we need to build out on that because you know, if the buildings are closed, as this series has been saying, what then? Um, so we're, we're pushing to see what more we can do to get it out there. Um, and I, hotspots, they're a Band-Aid solution. I will say that over and over and over. They're, we got, we got to get past that um, and move on to something that's, that's more robust. And I'm happy to answer any questions and I will throw some of these links into the chat if anybody is interested. Great, thank you, Lisa. Uh, it's, it's, it's such an important point about the, this kiosk and you're right, uh, they're designated uh, under the USAC rules, just like a bookmobile and as a, as a type of, a, of an outlet, a type of a branch and that, you know, designating what is a, a library, a library branch or an outlet is the responsibility of the state library agencies, <clears throat> the sole responsibility of the agencies. They are required to be part of a system. You can't just be a, a, a single library and then open up a, a, you know, a kiosk or you have to become a system which also requires the, the blessing of the, of the state agencies. And so that's why we've been so, uh, so active in working with the state agencies because they, you know, they have such a leadership role. They support uh, local libraries with, you know, grants and services and, and they're just been great partners all around. And, and thanks for coming back. This is a really good report and I look forward to uh, working on that. Any other questions for Lisa before we move on? We've got a, a packed lineup today, but it's just such a big I topic, public access. We people this, need to have to have some. Yes. Glenn, this, is that you? Yeah, no, this is Todd, but oh, um, sorry, Todd. Hi. Lisa, that is just freaking awesome. I'm just writing a text here. I, I need to learn more. We've got an IM, IMSL grant we're working on with uh, in, in Charlotte, uh, waiting on the approval for WISP. And your white space uh, model is just, I, I love it. It's, it's innovative I, I, and I'd love to learn more. If you have any other more detailed links on that or somehow to learn more about how you incorporated that, that is just very cool. Thank you. I, Don is actually the expert here on that. So he can give you some good information. Matt Delaney is the librarian in Millinocket and I will put his email address in the chat because he's used to me dropping his name. Um, very, very forward thinking guy. And I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you more about his experience as well. Your librarian of the years, I recall. Uh, yes, we actually uh, stole him from New York. Yeah, 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 you stole him from New York, Syracuse. Uh, Todd, uh, the, on, on the giglibraries.net site, you'll see the White Space Libraries project and it talks about how it's done. There's a two minute overview video. There's a link to the various uh, projects like the one in Millinocket that we were able to fund out of a IMLS grant. And, you know, go for it. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, it's not totally simple, but it's, it's, it allows you to build your own network, your own wide area network. 
and white space special capabilities is it can, you know, the low frequency can pass through obstructions. Uh, it's not high speed, high speed, you need line of sight. And so you have to evaluate uh, the environment. It's not the only way to connect these remotes, but it, it does work. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, uh, we'll look forward to following up here uh, uh, later as we've talked about uh, collaborating on this kiosk definition. We'd like to see a, a national definition, standard definition of a kiosk is we're just missing a huge bet here. It's the cheapest, most valuable thing I think libraries can do for, for access. So uh, Nathalia, please welcome. And uh, uh, the World Wide Web Foundation, the Alliance for Affordable Internet has been really leading on public access, I would say, more than almost anyone. So tell us what's, what's, what's what, Natalia, and what you're, uh, what you're up to now. Thank you, Don. And well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to meet you all virtually. And I would like to start um, saying, you know, talking a little, just like, real quick about what uh, A4AI is. It's an alliance comprised, it's a multi-stakeholder alliance. And we have coalitions in several countries in different continents. We have, uh, we formed these coalitions uh, with local uh, stakeholders from the private sector, public sector and civil society. Currently we have in Benin, Ghana, Mozambique, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Myanmar, uh, Dominican Republic, and Guatemala. And basically our work is pretty international, as you can see. So that uh, allows us to have a pretty good grasp of what's going on in these matters in different countries, right? Um, so first, uh, one thing that it might be obvious in many context within the US, but it's not, and we are currently advocating for, is the concept of meaningful connectivity, which means that, you know, basic access is not necessary. It's not uh, enough any longer. Uh, this might sound obvious, right? But in, in several countries, the way the policies and regulations are set and how they're measured they, they only uh, think about policy through uh, the provision of basic access. And we see that uh, one of the things we are advocating for is that uh, first, you will need to think about uh, a minimum threshold of speed, which is generally, uh, we consider the speed of 4G mobile, the, the minimum threshold, uh, enough data, um, which is having unlimited connection at home or a place of work or study. So the way we, we added this uh, in this, um, the advocacy work we are doing is that, you know, and that starts um, connecting with what we are discussing here is that uh, this, this, you should have it at least close to your home, not necessarily at your home, but close to your home. And, and again, I'm talking about uh, a minimum threshold that applies to the whole world, which is a hard thing to do, right? So we have to think about contexts of countries that have uh, really different environments and conditions than uh, the one that the US has. And having an appropriate device uh, so that means access to a smartphone, at least, and regular internet use, meaning that uh, you should be able to connect daily. I will put here the link uh, on the chat so that you can take a look further. And then, you know, what I wanted to talk to, um, and also making this comparison with other countries, but let's say we, you, you were talking about TV white spaces, right? Uh, in other countries, uh, this discussion has been ongoing for many years too, as it did in the US. However, in several places, uh, first, either you cannot, it's not yet regulated, 
or uh, you start having some tests, but it's not that, you know, a lot of time the regulatory constraints really affect the, the way uh, libraries and telecenters uh, are able to innovate in, in the way they can provide this access, right? So in many countries, in most countries, a lot of times you're not even able to test these technologies. Um, let's say I, I'm, I'm Brazilian, right? And, and the white space, TV white spaces have been debated here for 10 years, literally since 2010. I mean, it started really uh, as a, as a, you know, only a few folks in the regulator talking about it, but so that wasn't really well known at the time at all, but you know, still it was already a, a thing, right? And, and now, although you have some testing, it's not yet regulated fully, right? So as we see a lot of times, that's one of the problems we face. Um, and so that's one of the things we work on a lot is how to, um, it's helping countries to strengthen their reg policy and regulatory frameworks to avoid this sort of constraints, especially for community networks and libraries and other uh, types of institutions that provide this public access. Um, oh, well, I think that, well, it, it's, it's, almost Im impossible to talk about COVID-19, right? Uh, because it really uh, made the situation of some of the countries worse than before. Uh, I just saw recently um, that the OC OECD, for example, is going to publish a document in which they calculate that uh, in the rural, uh, the rural urban divide uh, in how the share of jobs amenable to remote work in OECD countries, the, the divide is, a, is around 15%. It let, imagine in developing countries, right? If, if in OECD countries, um, it, this gap exists and it's, uh, you know, a percentage that it's not that high, but still considerable, imagine in, in uh, developing countries. Um, I think that recently we saw in different parts of the world uh, a good movement towards uh, a larger awareness of community networks, for example. Uh, we, all, we even have in our uh, website a few case studies. I will also encourage you to look at it. Uh, case studies of countries that have in, uh, improved the policy and regulatory frameworks uh, to allow for community networks either to experiment or to become something that is uh, officially uh, fostered by the government, right? We have Mexico, Argentina, Brazil are some examples of that. I will also add, you, add, add the link here. Um, oh, well, I, I'll add the link later because it's not, it's not in my notes, unfortunately. Um, but I will take, I will put the link of two documents, specific documents we developed recently about public access. Um, well, every, every two years we have a really comprehensive report on affordability. So every time we, we cover this issue too, right? Um, and another issue we debate a lot and we try to track uh, how it's implemented in the different countries is the use of universal service funds. What we see internationally a lot of times uh, is that these funds either are not, a lot of times they do have a lot of resources but then they used for, um, for uh, purposes that are not necessarily the ones they were created for. Uh, they're used for fisc fiscal purposes. 
So let's say uh, to help the country having a, a surplus, a positive fiscal surplus. And also a lot of times they have regulatory barriers in terms of like, if a lot of times, for example, they, they can only be used for uh, deploying infrastructure, which is also super fundamental, of course. But besides deployment of infrastructure, sometimes you cannot use that for content, like, you know, uh, accessing contents or um, promoting digital literacy programs. And that's the type of country constraints they have too. Um, and yeah, well, I, I, one thing we are looking forward to developing further in terms of recommendations and projects and, and work, it's the, the literacy. I think that a lot of times the, the policy and regulatory frameworks of countries were still uh, the broadband plans were not always thinking about the literacy aspect. And we see that's a major gap. And then finally, countries are starting to add literacy to their broadband plans. Uh, and that's a, sort of the, I mean, it, it wasn't supposed to be a new uh, topic, right? But it's something that finally they're starting to realize. And because, I mean, the gap is getting wider in terms of literacy and, and, and technologies are getting even more advanced. So this gap might be even wider if we don't create a, a strategy in that regard. I think there's, these are my comments. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions, but these are just some comments I had. That's great, Natalia. Uh, it's such good work, but you, you've hit what I, what I think are all the major elements of, of, uh, of access, uh, public access, and that's the, the infrastructure level, uh, universal service, uh, the uh, ability for people to actually use it, which often gets, you know, just assumed. All the people that use the internet daily think that all you need is the internet and you're fine because you know, they know how to use it. And to imagine not having that knowledge, but it's not so simple. And so this is why one of the reasons we've fallen for libraries is, you know, they're, they're there to help people. They're natural uh, uh, institutions to enable uh, learning and take efficiency. Uh, uh. I think we may have well, lost I think no, we lost probably him. just leading yeah. lambs to slaughter. Uh, but uh, the white space, you touched on the white space and you, you described that process exactly. It's very slow. Uh, the regulators who are generally very differential, uh, deferential to uh, carriers are slow to implement this. Uh, Columbia has, has implemented uh, white space regulations. And I think most of the other countries in South America are in some stage of uh, trials, evaluations, and so forth. So good luck with that in Brazil. It would be, uh, it would be great for that to happen. Um, any, other, any other questions for Nathalia before we move to Stephen? On those, some excellent, excellent work and, and information. So uh, we'll, maybe we'll come back for time at the end for questions for all our speakers. But for now, Stephen, you're up, sir. Thank you, Don, very much for, for handing over. And I'm hoping that the, the connection works for me as well. I'm just fiddling around in order to share my screen. So I've got a little bit of a PowerPoint, mainly just to sort of keep myself vaguely structured throughout this whole thing. So um, there we go. So I'm Stephen Weiber, Manager for Policy and Advocacy at IFLA, that's the International Federation for Library Associations and Institutions. And we are the sort of the, the global organization for libraries of all types. We have members in about 153 countries. 
and in very brief terms our function is firstly to provide a space where people people in the library field can get together can talk can share experience can develop standards best practices help each other out but we also have this function of advocating both at the global level directly and in trying to support our members to draw on these international processes, international standards, international goals in their own work to actually ensure that libraries get the support they need to fulfill their missions. Now, I think my function um, in this presentation is to, um, to sort of make the bridge towards the discussion. So I'm going to try and go relatively quickly. I'm going to abuse the fact that we have a mainly Anglo audience to probably go a little bit too fast in the way I speak. But please do shout if I get to London, which tends to happen on a Friday evening. Um, so it, the, the letter T will disappear from my diction before the end of this, um, because that's what happens. So um, in terms of what we'll look at very quickly, um, we'll run through some of the, um, the evidence that we have at the international level, some of the arguments you, we make. I'm going to slightly abuse the possibility to share a bit of analysis that, that we've been doing. Um, then look a little bit at the commitments that we know are out there, both from experts and from uh, the international community, from governments, from world leaders. And then in order to sort of kick off this discussion, to pose some questions and share some thinking. So as you see on this slide, and I, I admit I'm experimenting with different slide formats and today is minimalist. So we'll, we'll see how well this works for everyone. And um, clearly we know what a difference public access can make. And I think the fact we're on this call um, underlines that, that, yes, you're on this call because you think the public access matters. However, in addition to all these, all the evidence we have, all the examples we have from the local level, anecdotally the difference, Fortunately, we can now begin to see some evidence of how this works internationally. So based on OECD data, um, because you know, it's OECD countries, sadly, that tend to have the most developed statistical systems and so are best able to actually share this stuff, we can start understanding, well, what is the access gap? And this is the access gap pre-COVID. And the statistics always take a little bit of time to get through. And so, for example, I'm just going to run through a few bits, a few measures of how big this gap is. Now, the definition I'm using of access gap here is the difference between two groups in terms of the percentage of each population that's accessed the internet in the last three months. And so, for example, based on this guy, this, you can see that in Hungary, there is a more than 50 percentage point gap between the prevalence of internet use amongst the richest 25% of households and the poorest 25% of households. You can see the US is there somewhere in the middle, around 15 points. Sweden, as usual, is the best in the world, and they know it, and they are somewhere around 3 or 4% percentage gap. What we can do that's interesting, actually, then, is compare this with levels of library provision in order to actually understand whether in countries, whether countries that tend to have more public or community libraries offering internet access per 100,000 people if in those countries the internet access gap is smaller and indeed we do find this. Um, Q4 re refers to the fourth quartile, the richest 25%, Q1 to the first quartile, the poorest 25%. Um, this is one example, but we can go through, we can look at others. For example, the age-related digital divide. What's the gap between people who are older? Um, so for this, the statistics we have available are the 55 to 74s. I know that doesn't count as particularly old. That's what the, that's the data we have. And younger, the 16, the 15 to 24. Again, we can see there's a huge gap in some countries. We can see that, for example, in Turkey, the gap between older people accessing the internet and younger is again more than 50 percentage points. You can also see that in most countries, the situation is worse for women than for men. So older women have a bigger gap compared to younger women than older men have compared to younger men. Again. We can look at the day and we can also look at this for gender. In most countries, there is a gender div digital divide that favors men. So more men have access to the internet than women. Um, full credit, obviously, to, I apologize, just receiving a call at the same time, which isn't helpful. Um, I'm just going to go back so I can see the screen myself. Um, you can see that the gender digital divide favors men over women. 
And you can see once again that this is worse among the older populations. So that yellow dot, the 55 to 74s, is significantly higher. Again, we compare these with figures for libraries. And we can see that in general, where you have more libraries off, libraries off the internet access, you have a smaller age-related digital divide, and you have a smaller gender-related digital divide. Next, very quickly, education. You can see that once again, the gap between people with lower levels of education, so just primary school, the share of them who are able to access, who've accessed the internet in the last three months is considerably lower than the share of people with a university education. Again, you can see older people suffer more from this. Look at it with libraries. Again, we see the same sorts of trends. Employment, similarly. Those who are out of work tend to have less access to the internet than those who are in work. Those who are retired tend to use the internet less than people who are in work. And again, you look at the look at combination, you look at the, the, the links between the numbers of libraries, and you can see that more libraries tend to mean a smaller gap. Now, why this all matters, I think you all know perfectly well. The internet can be a fantastic way for people to find work, to gain skills, to gain that extra opportunity, that second chance that they may not have had otherwise. Now, if you don't have access to the internet and you're in a situation where you may really need that second chance, that additional support, you risk falling into this vicious circle. The rich, frequently the male, the better educated, the employed, they've got the internet. They can continue moving up the ladder. Those who don't are stuck without. And this is why, again, these sorts of you know, being able to provide this public access matters. What's, of course, worth mentioning here, these are figures that are completely macro correlation is not causality, but it certainly points in the direction of saying that in those countries where you have more libraries offering that access, then you tend to have smaller gaps. Fortunately, we do have international expert opinion that says the same thing. Now, we can look at what governments have said. So Don is definitely sort of more of an expert on this. So I definitely wasn't in the job when WISIS started. Um, and yes, Dennis, I will, I will make the slideshow available and Everything's up on our blog and website as well. But um, already back in 2003, 2005, the World Summit on the Internet Sustainable Information Society set out as a target that governments should connect to all public libraries, archives, museums, cultural centers, and post offices. Already there was this recognition, building strongly on the early investment of libraries in giving people access to the internet, that this was a great way of getting people on board. We have expert support for this which should show up in a second, it's showing up on my screen. Yep, there we go, it's shown up. Now, this is a table with a lot of text. Uh, line, F is the, uh, line F is the one that's most interesting to us. Um, this is the result of a piece of work carried out by you know, Stanford um, ahead of the 2015 Internet Governance Forum. And they were experimenting with a technique called deliberative polling, where they would get people together and they would ask them a question. And in this case, what's the best way to get more, get the next billion online? And so they encourage that. Okay, recording resumed. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, again, pointing out that support for public libraries was a way of moving things forward. We see this in national connectivity strategies. And I think we've touched on some of this and, and certainly the work of A for AI is super helpful here. Um, we did a bit of work uh, last year that continues now looking across broadband strategies in place, how they refer to libraries, and we found a variety of different references, different ways of doing things. Clearly public access um, through digital skills that's coming in, although I think we're definitely with A for AI in pushing for a stronger focus on digital skills in uh, broadband strategies as a support for education, as a means of accessing heritage, as a means of supporting access to e-government services. Certainly within public access, we saw various examples. So some governments would just support building the cable out to the library. Some would actually support ongoing subscription costs, which is a key thing because it's great to have a subscription, but um, it's great to have a connection, but if you can't pay for it, that doesn't matter. Some do, which is welcome, support the provision of skills, support the provision of services to actually get people online. But we only have some examples, we'd love there to be more. Um, where we're beginning to go, and this is sort of where we start to drift into what, what is the plan for the future? What can we actually try and go for? This is definitely something that we've been working on with, with Don. 
but starting to think about what, how do we present this? How do we make the case most effectively? And one argument that we've certainly tried out and, and pushed at, at, in the context of the ITF is the idea that this public access and libraries, all of the elements mentioned earlier can be part of a wider package. So as I said, public access is one element of this, but crucially, and the examples from, from Middle Nocket, from Maine in general, are, are from Greenville in Maine, are super powerful here, that public access doesn't need just to be in libraries, it can also be around libraries if you stick that white space mask up on the roof. Um, we see a strong link with works that work to promote community networks. Indeed, we see examples of libraries actually being the hub of the university network, the, play, the, the community network, where that high-speed connection comes to, but also the place that relays it out to the rest of the village, to the town. Also, we know that in the short term, there are many places that simply won't be able to get that cable coming in, where it may not be feasible to get uh, TV white space working, Wi-Fi solutions working, and we see that offline internet packages, uh, projects such as those run by Libraries Without Borders can be a really powerful means of doing things. So that's sort of the, where we've got to. Now, simply to open up the discussion, because I know and we've already heard sort of a lot of, uh, both, both Natalia and Lisa have, have really touched on this one so far. Where our thinking is at the moment, and this is very much from the advocacy point of view, um, and this is really where we need to test your ideas and, and see what you think is feasible, what we can actually bring to the table. Um, the first challenge is always is demonstrating the dividend that comes from public access. Um, we know ourselves and almost we know so much ourselves that we can't, um, we know so much, I apologize, I've got another call coming in, which isn't helpful. Um, we know how much, um, we know how much libraries make a difference. We know what that we know what the help is, and um, we know what we contribute. We know the difference we make, but sometimes we don't always explain it as much as we should, and we don't always explain it in terms that make sense to other funders, rather than necessarily. And I know I'm speaking from a European point of view here, the finance ministry or the education ministry or whoever else actually pays the bills. We need to be able to explain that difference to a much broader range of people including, of course, telecoms regulators, digital ministries, digital agencies. Arguably, of course, we do need to show our commitment. Um, there's lots of people with fantastic ideas of how stimulus funding can be spent. Lots of people will be turning up with great plans, great projects. It is important to be able to show, to underline what we can do and what we should be doing. Of course, in doing this, um, we need to be careful to avoid setting ourselves up for a fall. And a very specific example from this, and, and this is from the experience at the global level, for example, promising free public access is a difficult one some of the time, because for libraries in Africa, for example, it's the possibility to charge low fees to people who can afford to access the internet that allows them to offer internet access to those who can't. And so there has to be that reflection on, well, can you? There's always that risk when we say yeah, internet access must be free and completely unrestricted because you can't ask people to do something they can't pay for and you can't necessarily ask them to break the law. However, what we can also do is strengthen our advocacy in order to try and get those laws changed and get that situation changed. So how can we more effectively make the message, take the message to the International Telecommunications Union, to others, to convince them that libraries need to be part of their education strategies, their inclusion strategies, their e-government strategies. Take those good examples that do exist, where they're good, and actually sort of spread them out. And then in doing so, thinking about how we get the ask right. And I really appreciated what Lisa was saying about at the beginning about, well, we have public access sort of, but it's not the public access that's actually making a difference right now. So to what extent do we need to reassess the asks we're making, to reassess the sorts of plans and strategies that we've tended to call for in the past, and actually think, well, that's not working anymore, let's not start, let's stop focusing uniquely on that, and rather look at, well, where do we go? So anyway, um, I'm going to stop there, because I think you, you're the ones with the experience, and I know this is such a great community to be working with in order to ask these questions, so I'm going to stop my sharing now, and hand back to Don. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I have uh, 
I have dialed in on my phone uh, through the cell system since my internet connection seems kind of flaky. There was a comment, somebody thought the, the session had paused. I hope it has uh, continued to record so that people can go back if they missed any of this. Excellent stuff, Stephen, you know, really dense. I think it's another reason to record these and, and have them uh, available for playback so people can uh, uh, rehear them, uh, to pause on and, and read some of these uh, uh, dense slides, if I may. Uh, any uh, questions for Stephen? Is if you're connecting with internews or other NGOs working community information systems, journalism, that's from... Not enough. Um, we, 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 we should be doing so more and, and in particular we should be, and then we encourage our members to do the same. And if, if, if there is a federation that sort of happily sits on top of things and our strength all of the strongest arguments come from our members. So we're more than happy, especially at the global level to connect, but of course also encourage those same connections to be made at the national level with those national library associations. Well, that's actually a really important point, isn't it? Uh, advocacy at what level? Uh, <clears throat> the members of IFLA are typically the national libraries and the national library associations. <clears throat> who themselves are made up of uh, state and local or provincial and local libraries <clears throat> and, and to whom, you know, is advocacy directed. Most of the, most of the enabling regulatory work is done at the national level. Universal service is invariably a national responsibility. Spectrum management uh, are, are all, always at, at the national level. And, and support for individual libraries is all over the place. In the US, it's typically local. Other places, it's provincial or national or, you know, they're just different. There's a wide variety of how libraries are supported in different countries. And it just, the advocacy has to be tailored around, well, where the, where the funds are coming from and, and not just funds, but other resources like Spectrum, for example. Uh, but uh, so that's that's one of IFLA's challenges is to, you know, how much to try to do directly to international organizations, which do have a voice, definitely. And then how much in support of their members, which has got to be the priority as they try to address uh, national scale issues or maybe local. Uh, I was going to add that there, there was also a point from Sean about U.S. Uh, Sean McLaughlin, who's saying that U.S. Congress is considering a resolution that will identify broadband internet access as a human right. Is that framework useful to IFLA? Uh, this this is one of the really interesting questions that we're having to sort of deal with at, at the moment. Um, I think I don't know, there, there have been some really good work already coming out of the Human Rights Council, especially in the context of internet shutdowns that underlines that it is a breach of human rights to shut off people's internet access and ergo internet access is a human right. Um, what's super interesting there is that the language of human rights can be seen as a little bit colonial sometimes it can be seen as the language of the world as it was in 1948 um, and it can tend sometimes to be there's always the risk that it's seen as being overused I think what we just need to be super careful about at the international level is, is it cynically picking the argument that works um, internet access as a human right is a really is, isn't well especially we believe it um, it is also a powerful argument in some contexts. In others, you go for enlightened self-interest. That simply having more people online means more jobs, more work, more tax. Um, and so you can also go down that line. So I think we welcome anything that talks about internet access as a human right. I think we just have to be aware that in trying to support members in advocating for more public access, that may not always be the one that sticks best. Uh, well said, Stephen. Is it, uh, <laughs> would, it, would it be more effective? Would there be higher levels of connectivity 
if there were some consensus by a majority of, of members of the UN that it was a human right. I'm not convinced that it would make any difference at that level. Um, is electricity a, a human right? You know, basically you're saying that if, you, if internet is, then so is electricity because you can't have internet without electricity. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case. I would absolutely assert that it's a basic service. And as a basic service, everyone deserves reasonable, affordable access to it. The same way, you know, we've treated uh, uh, elect electrification and telephone but not as uh, getting into uh, this particular area, which as you say, is highly charged. So let's not, let's not set up more roadblocks to adoption by challenging people at these uh, philosophical levels about the meanings of words uh, like human rights. I, it, it tends to be difficult anyway. Um, what else? I, I keep dropping and, and coming back. So this is the way I can follow the chat, which is now empty because I've just lost and reconnected. So if there are any other questions for Stephen or Nathalia or Lisa, please uh, step forward. Um, Don, this is Sean. I'll just, uh, I'll just chime in. I really appreciate the panel and uh, everybody's inputs because sort of takes us from the most local examples that we all experience, you know, in our communities of people interacting with a facility and a location and a service, and then all the way up to, you know, what does the digital divide look like across the world, you know, de demographically. So I just want to uh, thank you and the panel for really putting all these pieces uh, out at the same time in a thoughtful way. Um, for us, I'll just say it's all meaningful. We're working on um, looking at our libraries as the one location for miles around that has symmetric fast internet. And what does that mean to our local media infrastructure? What does that mean to receive and share media content? You know, uh, So we're trying to integrate local news uh, infrastructure um, ecosystems which are collapsing uh, in terms of market uh, structures uh, with community needs for a range of things and I really appreciated the comments about human rights I had that sense that it's all sort of cool to us here where human rights aren't a real issue but it's probably a little bit uh, patronizing in places where uh, human rights has a deeper longer history uh, than uh, currency than we have now. Anyway, uh, I just want to thank everybody. And um, I threw out a couple of terms that I want to, if anybody has thoughts about them, I'm curious. There's been this whole um, internet archive has been hosting these conversations about distributed web and how different functions of the cloud could be hosted locally at your library, <laughs> uh, sort of, and um, combined with comments I've been hearing from particularly Commissioner Rosenworcel at the FCC about the intelligent edge. That is, instead of building the systems where we're all more dependent on always on connections to remote you know, intelligence, that we ought to be building our libraries as our local intelligent asset that makes us autonomous from being, needing to be connected to every other place in the world. Anyway, I just thought, thought Oh. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point, Sean. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think Stephen touched on that a little bit when he mentioned the offline internet uh, approach, which, uh, you know, it can work in places that have never had the internet, it work in places that have it and have lost it, as, as your host is demonstrating today. Uh, and libraries are uh, situated to play a lot of the role that we think of uh, uh, providing cloud services like storage for your photos or uh, you know licenses for zoom that you might be able to use without having to get one a personal license there's a lot of potential in this direction and i think uh, you know it's it's also a smart strategy against outages it's a, a, some work we've done um it, hey, it also yeah Don. I just wanted to go back and mention briefly your thing about electricity. That should never ever be a problem. 
uh, I mentioned in the chat about using bicycles to be able to uh, uh, generate the electricity to store in batteries to power your stuff. I also built a generator on a mountain in Honduras that uh, utilized the river flow. You can also buy uh, broken solar panels and you'll get approximately a 75% uh, uh, of the availability of a new solar panel, uh, which you can get at almost no cost whatsoever. So never, never let electricity be a, a problem with setting up a local internet or electricity to a home or to a community. There's always ways around that, no matter where they live. Good point, Todd. Uh, most of these devices, and uh, uh, and as well as the communications uh, links, are fairly low power, right. and they don't require a lot of juice. It's not like trying to run your refrigerator with a bicycle. Uh, I also have a portable uh, uh, panel that and a, and a battery that uh, against outages. Um, also, also try. I'd like Try to think of libraries in the concept of branches too. A lot that I hear about is a library trying to Wi-Fi or connect out to their community. But if you had a branch, but you didn't have internet to them, uh, imagine that there's a uh, hard disk sitting somewhere and you've taken a, uh, a hard drive or an external drive or a USB and you've put books on it and you put education on it and you ship that over. They put it into their hard drive and now they have an inter internet, a local one with all their information on it that you provided by mail and now you've got a, a sort of a branch library without, with donor material without having to worry about getting Wi-Fi to everyone. This has been, Todd, this has been pioneered by uh, Bibliothèque Sans Frontières, Libraries Without Borders. Right. Uh, setting these up in refugee camps, probably the most difficult environment to do that very thing. And they have, they've presented, uh, and you'll find their presentation on archived on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net. And they have just developed a, uh, uh, an offline uh, internet platform, which uh, hosts all this various kinds of content, you know, things that are relatively small, but uh, in terms of data size, but very valuable, like uh, Wikipedia and the Khan Academy. And these, these are good strategies. They're good backup strategies in case of outages, and they're good uh, first uh, entry strategies in places that have not been yet reached. So I urge anybody interested in this to go back and have a look at that, uh, find, find that uh, presentation on the page and, and give it a deep dive. Um, just, a, just, a, just a quick pile on, I want to say for us, you can put on a thumb drive uh, all the local meeting gavel to gavel coverage of your local so, government meetings and, yeah. and, and make that available to your community too. So there's a currency and a media aspect to this uh, that ties right into news and information. Exactly. And, and communication also works that way asynchronously. Uh, you can periodically update your server so that mail coming in or going out wouldn't be fast, but it would eventually get in and out. Uh, and updating, you know, databases and so forth can be done that way, the way Todd described it, or, you know, by carrier pigeon, however you can get the, the, the data in and out. So we need, we're running over a little bit here. I'd like to wrap up. Uh, one of the things, this is a, a request, is... Uh, uh, we're now, this is session 22. These have been really extra, an extraordinary experience. We're looking to put together a proposal to submit uh, by October the 2nd uh, under the uh, IMLS grant uh, program. Uh, we think there's an opportunity for these uh, sessions, recorded sessions, to be used as part of professional development or continuing education whatever the appropriate uh, terminology is for the various uh, library professional uh, categories and would help, it would really help if anyone thinking how that might be useful could send in a note and, you know, just, just your opinion about it. You can send it to info at giglibraries.net. 
uh, we'll we'll do an email kind of entreaty along these lines. But feel free if if you think that uh, these are valuable and how they might be used in in uh, a program like that. We're talking to a couple of different uh, uh, library institutions about you know certifications and incorporating into programs. Uh, the last point I would make was uh, uh, before we thank our speakers is that next week we have. Uh, uh, a great lineup. We've got Vince Cerf, the father of the internet, if you will, the co-father of the internet, the, one of the two guys that actually developed the original uh, protocol for the internet, TCP/IP, and 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 the uh, uh, the the address convention and so forth. It was a basis of the original internet uh, way back, and Vince will be on uh, along with Crosby Kemper, the the IMLS director who could be in conversation with Vint and also joined by David Lankus, the uh, esteemed librarian from uh, the University of South Carolina. So we'll have all three of these uh, fellows on uh, next week, next Friday, it'll be an opportunity. Uh, so another request would be send any questions you would like to put to these, these folks. Uh, and the more on the spot you can put them, the more welcome your questions will be. Uh, so with that, I want to bring this to a close, but first I'd like to ask everybody to unmute. If you would, please unmute, unmute. And we'd like to, sorry, I need to mute. I got two things going on. Okay, I'd like to give our, our speakers a round of applause, please. It's really been great today. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. So, Thank you so much. some banging around going on. Hey, how's it going? Hang around a little bit, uh, uh, but the recording we can close now.